Okay, our first reading will be Atrahasis, which is also called When the Gods Like Men, or When the Gods Instead of Men. Uh, it's given that title in its original. When I say it's original, I mean the tablets you see in the background. Uh, the ancient uh, cuneiform tablets that this is derived from, uh, they didn't have names like titles. They uh, titled their work by the first line. And the first line of Atrahasis, as you're going to see in Stephanie Dolly's translation, it's when the gods instead of men. Uh, uh, that's just a fragment of a sentence. You'll, it'll make more sense when you read it. But it's going to be referred to at the end of the, the text uh, by that title, just that line, when the gods like men. Uh, this text and the, the tablets that most of it uh, come from uh, are dated to between the years 1900 and 1700 BCE, before the Common Era, or just BC. Uh, so this is about the beginning of narrative literature. Just a reminder where it comes from. This is modern day Iraq. And uh, we're going to refer to it as Mesopotamia because it's not specifically Iraq. Uh, although, by the way, the, the modern word Iraq comes from the names of one of these cities, Uruk. But it's called Mesopotamia because it's between these two uh, very large rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as part of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, we're going back about 5,000 years to the begin when Sumeria is the Sumeria is the first sort of major civilization in Mesopotamia. Uh, when the Sumerians invent writing, uh, they invent a type of writing called cuneiform. Now, about the same time, uh, hieroglyphics were being developed in uh, Egypt. Uh, but these are not completely separate cultures, as you can see from the map. Uh, they're, uh, the Fertile Crescent sort of connects the, the edge of Egypt with uh, the Mesopotamian River Valley. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the interchange between the uh, cultures up and down that, uh, that path. But about the same time the Greeks are developing hieroglyphics, the Sumerians are developing cuneiform. And the earliest cuneiform writings are developing around 3100 BC. Uh, we have uh, uh, urban development happening in this area before it happens anywhere else, uh, pretty much anywhere else in the world. We have large villages and village complexes, but nothing like the urbanization we see happening in Mesopotamia. Uh, just for some perspective, this is uh, still about uh, a thousand years or two thousand years before the Trojan War, uh, same amount of time uh, almost uh, since the, the writing of the Bible, uh, before the com compilation of the Iliad and the Odyssey, long before all of these cultures become what we know them as being, before ancient Greece and ancient uh, Israel become the, the cultures we're vaguely familiar with, uh, the Sumerians have already created uh, a major sort of uh, world culture. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, it was the first urban culture. Uh, the city of Ur, which is uh, you know, close to the, the mouth of the uh, Euphrates River, would be the largest city in the world for 2,000 years, uh, up until the, the rise of Rome. Uh, before that, there was no city in the world that was this big, and no city that we would really recognize as a city, like as a, as a, a large metropolitan area, uh, the way that Ur was. Uh, the name Mesopotamia uh, means land between the rivers, uh, I may have mentioned already. It's between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and if you look at this sort of, uh, this drawing of the, the landmass, you see the Zagros Mountains in the north, uh, you see the deserts to the west and to the south, uh, but in that middle portion, you've got, you're in a really dry area, but it's also a watershed area, so uh, it's surrounded by really dry areas. Uh, but all the rain that falls, the, as rare as it is for it to fall, whenever it falls in those areas, it all washes down through uh, Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia has a pretty steady supply of water. And that water makes it what, what it is. It enables the agriculture, uh, it enables transportation over further distances than most people are able to, to, to travel, and it also, the, the the clay that uh, the, the earth is, is mostly composed of at that, uh, in that area uh, forms the building material. So wet clay that dries, uh, there's, there's not enough, as you can tell from this uh, uh, picture, 
or this reconstruction, there are not a lot of forests around. In fact, as you'll see when we get to the Epic of Gilgamesh, you have to go a long way to find trees that are large enough to build anything out of. So the only thing you have to build with is clay. Uh, but they build really well with it, uh, very well with it. Uh, but they also build out of reeds. They can build buildings out of reeds, and reeds are these, you know, really tall grasses that grow in swampy areas. Uh, here in Corpus Christi, we have a lot of these sorts of things because our geography is not that different than the Mesopotamia. But imagine if we didn't have any of the trees, even as small as our trees are. All we had were these reeds. Uh, you can bind these reeds together and build uh, real, relatively strong buildings. Uh, the buildings that uh, in some places are still built, uh, and also the boats that are still built out of these reeds, which I'll discuss in a second. Uh, these have been built the same way for all of this time, for four, maybe five thousand years. Uh, and there were communities living in Mesopotamia pretty much very close to the way they'd been living for thousands of years, up until the 1980s and 90s when Saddam Hussein sort of drained the swamp, uh, literally, uh, drained out some of these areas of the Mesopotamian River Basin that uh, where these people had been living. So killed off the leaves, they had to move, uh, sorry, killed off the reeds, uh, they had to uh, relocate. Uh, but until that, we still had people building reed boats, uh, like the, the guy you see on the left, um, uh, as well as building these reed houses. Uh, the way you see a, a picture of one, a modern one on the right, but in that uh, top uh, center picture you see uh, a carving of one uh, from a tablet that is uh, uh, more than 3,000 years old. Uh, we also see depictions in the art from thousands of years ago of uh, boats very similar to the ones that are uh, were still being built up until the late 20th century. Uh, and most importantly, the reason we're talking about this culture is because this culture is the first one to produce writing, uh, like I said. And the writing they produce isn't exactly what we might expect. It's not taking some sort of ink and then writing on a piece of paper. It's not on parchment. It's not on, uh, not even on papyrus, even though papyrus will be developed shortly hereafter. It's written on clay tablets. Like I said, they built everything out of clay because they didn't have the trees for it. They also use that instead of papyrus for uh, writing, and it's a good thing they did, because uh, ancient papyrus that was, you know, uh, written thousands of years ago, uh, for the most part, has completely decomposed. Every now and then, we'll find something from two thousand years ago, maybe through, maybe twenty five hundred years ago. I'm not sure what the oldest papyrus is, but it's not nearly as old as these tablets. And these tablets survived because even when the libraries that they were stored in burned to the ground, when an invading army would invade. Uh, they would destroy all the temples, destroy the libraries, destroy the palaces, set everything on fire. But when you have a clay tablet set on fire, all that really does is solidify it. It makes it even stronger. Uh, the thing is, then the building uh, collapses onto those tablets, so it, it shatters them into fragments. So you still have a lot of writing that's visible. It doesn't burn, but it tends to be broken up the way you see here. Um, and we have a lot of uh, tablets coming from libraries like the kind I just, just described, kind that uh, they get uh, compiled, there are uh, thousands of years of scribes who are there recording uh, oral traditions, stories they've heard, mostly recording things like uh, uh, financial records. Um, in fact, long before we have any kind of narrative text, we have uh, records of financial transactions. Uh, somebody from uh, Egypt or from uh, uh, Syria uh, wants to trade with somebody from Mesopotamia and they send uh, merchants to you know carry these livestock or, or something like that well they have to get something back they have to have something to show that I sent uh, this merchant with 20 sheep uh, to trade to this person for uh, some silk or gold or whatever uh, I don't want that person taking my 20 sheep to show up with 15 sheep and say that's all that he gave me. I want to have some way to send a message uh, to that, that, uh, that other destination that I won't be going to so that person knows that I actually did send 20 sheep. So this is what most of these texts are being used for but of course it doesn't take long before people start to use them to write down other things, uh, record uh, stories that people for the most part assume that all you have to do is tell. Uh, just like you may not read that much because you spend more of your time watching television or watching movies or on the internet, but uh, 
you tend to sort of think, well, that's where I get my entertainment for the most part. Uh, narratives were the same way. Most of the time you would hear somebody tell a story, you wouldn't think, oh, somebody should write this down. But luckily for us, somebody did. So it developed, I compared it earlier with hieroglyphics, which we tend to think of as being pictures. Well, cuneiform started out as pictures as well. Uh, that uh, each of these uh, uh, cuneiform texts or cuneiform uh, letters or words is arranged in uh, columns. So uh, the first column is a picture of an ox at the top in the blue. And then below that is the cuneiform representation. Uh, that it would later take on. So if you wanted to carve into wet clay uh, a picture of an ox, you could draw, you could sort of drag your stylus uh, across and make these, uh, make these marks that you see in the top. But that takes a long time. So if you're writing out something along, that's going to take a long time to drag your, your, your stylus through this. So instead, people start to just push uh, the stylus in and make these wedge shapes that you, know, you can see in the second uh, row that ox has now started to look like, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, uh, maybe six uh, impressions done with this flat stylus. And the stylus, the tip of the stylus looks uh, not like the type, tip of a pencil, but the tip of a flathead screwdriver. So imagine taking a wet piece of clay, pushing it with a flathead screwdriver. Uh, the, the thing on top is going to be a lot more difficult to make than the thing just below it. As long as you know that second thing is an ox. Well, as that gets developed and you try to start writing faster uh, and it changes over time, uh, the word doesn't just mean ox by itself, it now means gu, and I'm maybe mispronouncing this, but that uh, syllable is more important than the image of the animal of the ox. Uh, same thing happens with a bird, you can kind of see that it looks like a bird uh, in the second column, but by the time uh, 600 years passed and you're working with these styluses, these flathead screwdrivers, it starts to look like something very different. Um, and you know, if you look at water, the wavy lines at the top make a lot of sense, but the, the thing it becomes by 650 BC uh, doesn't look like anything I'd associate with water. And the one for head, yeah, I don't even know. But you can see how it starts as, a, as an image, it then takes on a phonetic value, it doesn't really matter what uh, object it refers to, it matters more what the pronunciation is. And we combine those to make uh, make words, to make names, to make that sort of thing. And here are some of the tablets that uh, the story of Atrahasis is written on, that the narrative of Atrahasis. Uh, these come from between 1900 and 1700 or 1600 BCE. Uh, we have uh, pieces of them that you can tell by the, the cuneiform on each one, they weren't written by the same person. These were written at different times by different people, but we can tell that they're writing the same narrative of the same uh, story. Uh, there are going to be other versions of this Atrahasa story, obviously, that once you get into it, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about, and we'll talk more about that after you've read it. But right now, I'll just say that you'll see several different uh, uh, in the text that, t that uh, we're going to read, you're going to see several different notations that won't make much sense if you're expecting to read a novel. But the reason they're there is because we're starting with texts like this, we're starting with uh, manuscripts like this, uh, broken uh, clay tablets with cuneiform on them like this, uh, that were uh, written by different hands at different times, but are trying to tell what seems to be the same story, probably something from oral tradition, a story that maybe not exactly word for word, but pretty close to word for word, as close as that scribe can get. Now, if, you, if a modern reader wants to figure out what's on these tablets, it goes through several processes. Uh, so two cuneiform experts, W.G. Lambert and A.R. Millard, uh, went through uh, all of these Atrahasis tablets and transcribed them from the cuneiform into the phonetic uh, uh, pronunciation. Uh, of those words. So they took those uh, what had eventually become phonetic letters and translated them into the words that they pronounced in the, the Roman letters that we use today. And then they also offer a translation. Uh, but you'll notice the, the brackets uh, and then the, the ellipses, the, the periods between uh, those brackets, those indicate that uh, you can't really tell. You can tell this word starts off as being this, but it might be one thing, it might be another. 
Well, this is actually the text that your translator, Stephanie Dolly, uses. Uh, she uses the column on the left. Uh, she doesn't use exactly their uh, English translation on the right, but she uses their column on the left uh, when she writes uh, the book, or compiles the book, uh, Myths from Mesopotamia. And the steps that she goes through, and she also uh, combines uh, tablets from uh, uh, other sources besides the, the Lambert and Millard uh, Atrahasis uh, account. But each time it goes through one of these translations, uh, the translator has to make a decision. Do, this word is probably this, but the end is broken off. And um, Should I go ahead and translate it as that thing I think it is, or should I uh, leave it open? Uh, so even uh, Lambert and Millard had to make those decisions. And then Dolly is using uh, their text instead of going right back to the actual tablets. So she has to, uh, she will pick up whatever decisions, editorial decisions they make, incorporate them in her translation. But then she'll also have to decide, well, would a modern English uh, audience interpret something this way, or would they uh, misunderstand it, so I do, need, do I need to change the word? And then how do I deal with all those broken areas? Well, every time you take other sources and you translate them or you decide what do I keep, what do I leave out, what do I uh, change, do I need to change the meaning a little bit so that people understand, do I need to create a coherence, remember that term, uh, associative coherence we used uh, in the previous uh, lecture, do I take something that doesn't make sense to try to make it more coherent? Well, that's called redaction. Redaction is the process of compiling a single text from multiple texts and editing them to make the new text more coherent. Uh, and again, just a reminder, it's red letters. That's a term I want you to know later on. We'll be using that throughout the rest of the semester. Okay, so here's a page uh, from Myths of Mesopotamia that uh, is one of the ones you're going to read. And notice that there are these open brackets. Uh, that means in that first open bracket, there's a line that can't be read. So it's one of those where there's a crack or there's uh, the, the cuneiform has been rubbed to where it's just smooth and you can't tell what it says. So instead of trying to fill in the gaps, and this is something that if somebody was translating this for a, a popular press book, the kind you would uh, expect to read like a novel, uh, then they might decide, well, this probably means this, I'll go ahead and make this thing up. But, but Dolly doesn't do that. She leaves these brackets open and says, basically, we don't know what's there. But that means as a reader, you have to decide what goes there. Now, you don't actually have to decide, but you're probably going to find yourself filling in the gaps immediately. Uh, uh, if it's something that you can go ahead and infer, you might do that. But sometimes you're not going to have any idea what goes there, and that's okay. It's okay not to know what goes in the gaps. You'll, then again, you'll see also some brackets that do have text in there. Now, I'm going to talk about where those texts uh, come from. If, if that's from a, a broken area, then where did she get these words? How does she know what's there if there's a, a break in that fragment? I'm going to leave that question open for right now. I'm going to come back to that uh, later on. But I want you to go ahead and see if you can figure out where those words come from. When you read this in the larger context, you're going to start to maybe see, oh, I recognize those texts from somewhere else. So in the meantime, you figure out where uh, those words within the brackets came from if, the th if there's actually a crack or a break there. Um, you're also going to see the letters OBV and SBV in the left-hand side, uh, left-hand uh, margin. Uh, don't just overlook that. Those are important. They're going to be even more important when we read the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, OBV stands for the Old Babylonian Version. Uh, SBV stands for Standard Babylonian Version. Those come from uh, two different what we call recensions. Uh, the oldest and the majority of the Atrahasis uh, text that you're going to read comes from uh, these tablets that were uh, written down somewhere between 1900 and 1700 BC. Uh, but sometimes there's going to be big breaks or things are going to be missing, and Dolly is going to use the standard Babylonian version to fill in. But she'll tell you over in the left-hand column that she's switching from OBV to SBV. So that's what that means. Uh, what came before, like in this example, what comes above the OBV must have been the SBV, the Standard Babylonian Version, the one that came around uh, between 700 and 650 BC. Uh, and then when you see OBV, everything after that is going to be back to the Old Babylonian Version. And like I said, without Trahasis, the majority of what we're going to read is from the Old Babylonian Version. So really, really ancient literature. Uh, 
But because there's so many breaks, because uh, there's so many gaps, and because this is something that comes from a very, very different cultural context, uh, I'm going to go through a quick list of characters, the Dramatis Personae. Uh, we have the title character of Atrahasis. Uh He's a human, he's the only human mentioned in this entire uh, story. He's a, a king of Shurupak, we're told. You'll notice that uh, uh, Shurupak, the city, is really close to the city of Uruk. It's close to the city of Babylon. It's between. The, it's literally right between the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates River. Uh, and it's one of the oldest places that where we find uh, ancient writing. So it's possible there uh, was a historical uh, king named Atrahasis. But as we're going to get to later on when we talk about his uh, his parallel characters, this is probably uh, a, a more of a literary figure that uh, his name is going to have a meaning similar to names that we're going to come across later on. So the story, or the, this narrative tells us he's the king of Shurupak, he's a human king, and he's a devotee of the god Inki, or Ea. Now, a very important aspect of switching back and forth between the Old Babylonian version and the Standard Babylonian version is the Standard Babylonian version is written at a time when the same god is described as Ea. His name is Ea. But the old version, the, the older version of the god and the older version of these texts, uh, his name is Enki. Well, Enki uh, is a very prominent uh, god in the Sumerian and Babylonian pantheon. Uh, these are slightly different pantheons, but they're all, all the Mesopotamian cultures sort of adapt each other's gods and they change their names sometimes or they change their stories a little bit. Usually they change who's more important. So uh, the, the, the god Elil, we'll see later, uh, will be uh, replaced by a god named Marduk after Marduk's culture overtakes uh, Elil's culture. But Enki is pretty well respected as a, as a god and as a character uh, in, in all of these cultures for you know, a couple of thousand years. Uh, he's known both as Enki and Ea. He's the god of the fresh water, uh, which is called the Apsu. Uh, a water god might not seem like that important a god, but remember, this is the land between the rivers. This is a land uh, sandwiched between a desert, one of the worst deserts on earth, and uh, dry mountains, uh, both of which are very inhospitable. So these rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, enable not only life, but enable this you know, uh, flowering urban civilization. So obviously in this place, the god of fresh water is gonna be very important. Uh, fresh water, by the way, is distinct from the type of salt water you'd have in the Persian Gulf, even in the mythology. Uh, the salt water has its own uh, gods, in particular the, the monster called Tiamat, uh, which I may talk about later on. But uh, fresh water is the water of life. It's sometimes referred to as sweet water in some of these translations. He's also the god of wisdom. Uh, he's a god of wisdom, and that doesn't just mean he's wise himself, but he's a helper of mankind. Uh, he sends these uh, seven sages uh, to teach humans technology, art, and philosophy. Uh, he's also a trickster. He's not entirely upfront with everything, as we're going to see in, in Atrahasis. He's going to uh, make a promise and then break that promise in Atrahasis, and we'll learn more about what's going on there uh, uh, as we move into the Epic of Gilgamesh. But uh, all of these elements are going to be very important because this character we're going to see transform as uh, his, uh, his story gets retold across cultures. Uh, then there's the, the eldest of the gods, uh, the father of the gods, is called Anu. Um, after him, all the elder gods are called the Anunnaki. Uh, they're the, the gods of, the, of an older generation. A lot of mythologies have this. There's a, a generation of gods a long time ago, and then they're replaced by these younger gods in, in Greek uh, mythology. Uh, it was Cronus, or the Latin Saturn, uh, who is later, he and the Titans are later replaced by the god Zeus or Jupiter. Well, Anu is uh, later, uh, I don't know if you'd say he retires or whatever, but uh, Elil, his son, who is the the war god and the sky god, he later uh, replaces Anu, uh, although it's a peaceful transition, uh, or maybe he just steps up to power and Anu's still in the background. Anu still tends to make uh, a lot of decisions. Uh, but Elil is the, really the more, most forceful, the most outspoken, the most demanding. You can tell this is somebody who thinks he ought to be in charge. Uh, he's also referred to in, in sometimes in the text as Enlil, but he's the war god and he's a sky god. Uh, in other words, he's a storm god. So it's not just the, the peaceful sky, but when he comes, he brings the storms with him. And he's the chief god of the Agigi. These are the younger sky gods. They follow Elil 
but they are subordinate to the Anunnaki, the Elder Gods, which Elil himself is an Elder God, uh, as is Enki and, of course, Anu. Nintu is uh, called the Womb Goddess. Uh, she's referred to also as Belet Ili uh, or Mami, and literally that, that's how it will be pronounced, Mami. Uh, this tends to be a, a common feature uh, of all languages because when infants are just learning to talk, the M sound is one of the first ones they're able to make. And, you know, who are they making it to? Who's always the, the one that's closest to an infant? It's going to be the mother. So that's why mater in Latin, you know, uh, muter in, in German, uh, muti in, uh, in Hindi. Uh, across the world, there's these M sounds. But literally, the womb goddess is named Mami. More often than in, in the text, she'll be referred to as Nintu or Belatili. Uh, she is the creator of humans, and as the womb goddess, you might think, oh, well, I know how she creates humans. Watch how she actually creates humans. Uh, this is a very important point. And remember where we are. In Mesopotamia, everything's built out of uh, clay. Uh, the, the building's built out of clay. The, uh, the tablets are built out of clay. Uh, watch the, the story of the creation of human beings uh, with that in mind. And when we talk about the world, a lot, or when you read this text, a lot of things aren't going to make much sense. If you are thinking about the Earth as this sphere and, you know, uh, outer space, you know, being outside of it in the sun, uh, being stationary in the Earth orbiting that, uh, keep uh, in mind how the, the Mesopotamians envisioned the, the world. The world was, of course, flat, but uh, it wasn't, or there was a sort of round dome over it. So if you look at the sky, it looks like a dome. Uh, but there are, uh, if, the, if the sky is a dome and the, scar, uh, the, the stars are up there, they must be attached to that dome. But now where does the rain come from? Well, in the Mesopotamian conception, there was this, uh, uh, this firmament, this sort of uh, ceiling, basically, on the sky. And there were these vents, or these gates. You're going to see it referred to as the gates of the sky in the, the text of Atrahasis. Uh, and those gates could be opened, and that allowed the, the water that was up above that firmament. There was this big tank of water above the, the ceiling of the sky. And those vents could be opened, and that's where the rain came from. And you wanted that rain to be, you wanted those gates to be opened every now and then so that water would fall down into the rivers and, and water your crops and, and that sort of thing. But you didn't want too much rain because you're in this river valley, and if there's too much rain upstream, well, then you've got a flood coming. Uh, another source of water is the water under the earth, and this is the Apsu. Uh, this is uh, uh, Inki's domain. And so the Mesopotamians noticed that even when it wasn't raining, uh, there was water coming up into the river. And so uh, there were natural springs where uh, water would come up through even when there was a clear sky. Uh, so this is another source of fresh water, or sweet water, as, they, uh, as the Mesopotamians described it. Uh, and then you've got mountains on either side surrounding the world. That holds up this dome of the sky. And also you've got an underworld uh, uh, and sort of, you know, conceived of as a cave region. There's going to be, uh, we're going to see later, that's where the, the souls of the dead are. Uh, and then even below that, there's the, the deep, which is sometimes just referred to as the, uh, the waters of the deep. And this is water that you can't drink. This is not the sweet water. This is salt water or, or something like that. This is the realm of the goddess Tiamat, or the, the, the monster Tiamat. Uh, but the, importantly are the, the gates. The, uh, the gods are imagined as having keys to the, the sky, the vents in the sky that let the rain down. They have keys to the, the spring water uh, doors that prevent the water of the Apsu from coming up into the rivers. And they can lock those and so there, there's no water or they can open them up and so water comes out. This is, uh, if you're trying to imagine what they're talking about, imagine the world looking like this. Okay, so um, I'll, uh, there's several questions I want, to, I want you to think about as you read uh, Atrahasis. Uh, you know, you don't have to keep this list next to you the whole time you read it. Just read it and try to figure out what's going on and then think about these questions and then maybe go back and, and look and see if you can find the answers. And I put the page numbers there to kind of lead you to where I'm, where I'm looking if you're confused. The first is, who is the main protagonist of the narrative? Now, a protagonist is the primary character in a narrative who must overcome the conflict to achieve a goal. The antagonist is a character who is the main source of conflict for that protagonist. Uh, so who is the main protagonist and who is the main antagonist? Uh, also think about uh, or, or try to figure out why do the gods create humans to start with? 
and how do they create humans? Uh, why does Elil want to destroy humanity? Uh, what are the primary conflicts faced by the gods? Uh, what, uh, how do the gods uh, resolve their disputes with each other? Uh, who says this line? Do not revere your gods, do not, rep do not pray to your goddess. Uh, and how is this strategy meant to work? Why does this, this person say this? Uh, what kind of relationship does Atrahasis have with Enki? Uh, I've already said that he's a devotee of Enki, but there are a lot of different ways that a relationship between a human and a god could go. Look and see how that relationship works. What kind of relationship does Enki have with Elil, uh, the, uh, a fellow god? How do the gods feel after the flood? Uh, what do we know about Anu, the chief god? What do the sacrifices made by humans do for the gods? In other words, why do, gods, or why do humans make sacrifices to gods? Is it just to say, hey, I'm, I'm devoted to you? Do the gods actually get something out of it? Uh, watch for that. How do the gods finally resolve the conflict with the human population? And lastly, uh, who is the first to hear the song or the narrative of the flood, according to the narrative itself? And this is going to be right, right toward the end. Uh, Right toward the end, we're going to have some lines of text that tell us a lot about not uh, just what's in that narrative, but how that narrative uh, came down to us. So enjoy your reading, and I'll post another video uh, to watch after you've uh, finished your reading.